from the director of the Oregon Department of Transportation in 1996. As ODOT's chief executive, she oversees a biennial budget of $1.7 billion and 4,800 employees. She manages Oregon's statewide transportation policy and development for surface and air transportation, driver and vehicle licensing, and motor carrier programs. Grace received her bachelor's degree from Gonzaga University and a master's degree from Willamette University. She's worked on the staff of the U.S. Senate Appropriations Transportation Committee and has served as Portland's Deputy Director of Transportation. From 1993 until her appointment at ODOT in 1996, Grace was Deputy Administrator of the Federal Transit Administration, where she helped shape and negotiate 13 major rail projects worth more than $6 billion. She's used to dealing with money. Laura Pryor has been Gillum County Judge for over 10 years. She's also Chair of Gillum County Board of Commissioners and County CEO. As Board Chair, she oversees juvenile court, probate, adult and juvenile guardianships, and adoptions. Judge Pryor was President of the Association of Oregon Counties in 1996 and served on the State Committee of the Oregon Transportation Initiative. She has, for the past 10 years, fought what she sees as the abandonment of Oregon's rail system, and she's been an advocate for adequate funding for Oregon's roads and highway system. Judge Pryor grew up in California, but she's resided in Gillum County for almost 20 years. In addition to running Gillum County, Judge Pryor helps her husband run their cattle and wheat ranch in Condon, Oregon. So we'll start first with Grace Kunikum. Fran, it's nice to be here today. Um, I'd like to acknowledge in the audience I have two of my five commission bosses here, Henry Hewitt and John Russell, and I have five of my family bosses here, uh, the Krennic and Clan. I've got Bruce and Dan, Mike, Adrian, and uh, Joyce. Sorry, Joyce. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, thank you for inviting us here today. It's my great pleasure to be on the podium with Judge Laura Pryor. She's a great supporter of transportation in this state and she's a great friend of Eastern Oregon and helps represent it as we have those discussions. I am here today uh, not unlike a uh, board of director, an officer of a company, speaking before the stockholders, uh, to talk with you as Oregonians about your transportation investment. I'm here to report on three things today. One is how your investment in transportation is being utilized. Two, what the department is doing to improve your return on investment and three, how the current transportation investment strategy will impact Oregon's future. Let me begin by introducing you to your State Department of Transportation. We have 4,800 employees, as was mentioned earlier. That's down about 10% from what it was 10 years ago. We have a billion seven biennial budget. That's about the same as it was the last biennium. There are about 85,000 roads in this state only 7,500 of those are run by ODOT, so with just uh, about 9% of the roads in the state, we carry about 61% of the traffic. There are 7,000 bridges in the state which we're responsible for inspecting. Only 2,600 of those are owned by the state. And about 40% of the bridges we own are over 40 years of age. Of those bridges, 58 of those bridges are in poor condition, not bad on a base of 2,600. But if we were to bring those 58 bridges into good condition, that would cost us $85 million. Once you get a, size, a sense of the size of the system and what it costs to run it. Um, we have uh, transit. We provide uh, some aid to transit in the state. There are over 200 transit providers. 86 million transit trips are taken in Oregon alone. But your state government pays about $15 million toward transit on a base of about $250 million of that which is spent in the state. $15 million for a $250 million investment. There are about 2,500 miles of rail in the state, about 2,700 grade crossings. A grade crossing costs about $300,000 to put in. We have over 500 airports in the state. 400 of those are privately owned, 100 publicly. Only 33, only, <clears throat> excuse me, only 33 of those owned by ODOT. 
Um, the DMV in the state has 67 field offices. We have about 2.6 million drivers in the state. We have about 3. Point million autos. Ray, we're going to have to work on that. Um, DMV processes about 40 million transactions a year. Um, and we have about 20,000 customer contacts every single day. It's interesting to note that DMV is not just responsible for driver safety, for licensing, um, and for the regulation of uh, the, the uh, individual. We also do a lot of consumer protection through our auto sales. We also have an air quality responsibility on checking with DEQ compliance in the Portland and Medford areas. We help with voter registration through the Motor Voter Program. And we're also a property tax collector through manufactured home property taxes. In our motor carrier services uh, branch, we have 66 ports of entry and way stations in the state. There are 35,000 uh, trucking firms, if you will, that operate in Oregon. That means about 28, excuse me, 280,000 trucks. With that kind of a portfolio, we could focus on the details a lot longer. But what I've asked my managers to focus on is ODOT becoming a remarkable agency. In July, I charged our State Department of Transportation with becoming a remarkable agency, not in five or 10 years, but by January 1st of 1999. That gives us about, gave us about 18 months. The clock is ticking. Some of my managers started wondering about what a remarkable agency was, how you would define it. Um, and they were concerned that it wasn't measurable. You'll see in a minute that I'm into some measurements. Um, and what I told them though was having been through the last legislative session, uh, neither were the words used to describe us measurable, uh, nor were they uh, polite in many cases. <laughs> so uh, words like arrogant and wasteful don't have measurements, and neither does the word remarkable, but we're going to get there. Uh, I think an example of that is the recent I-5 Trunyan project. I think it's an example of us becoming a remarkable agency and shows what we can accomplish when we work together with our transportation partners and with the public. It was remarkable in two ways. First, to meet the challenge of managing traffic, we formed a coalition of employers, of law enforcement officials, of transportation providers, and of governments. The news media and the public responded with support and cooperation. Together, we reduced the demand on the system. The community found ways to help us make the project work. It was the community that helped us, and what we discovered was that what made news was the absence of traffic. Second, on a technical basis, ODOT used a combination of design and contract incentives to let the private sector do what the private sector does best, and that's make a profit. The cost of the, to the community of the bridge closure was between one and five million dollars a day. In the end, what happened was remarkable. With the right contractor, with the right incentives, we took a 21-day project closure and made it a six-day project closure without any traffic demands, excuse me, without any traffic jams. Now, what that represented was not just ODOT doing its job, but doing its job better because it reached out to the community. That's truly remarkable. As the Department of Transportation, in addition to becoming a remarkable agency, we are also taking steps to increase your return specifically on your taxpayer dollars through efficiency and productivity gains. We made a pledge to the legislature as a result of the Oregon Transportation Initiative and as a result of conversations we had with the legislature to achieve a 1% productivity improvement each year over the next 20 years. I hope to be around for some of that, maybe not all of it. But I think in working with the managers, we're going to get not the 1%, but a 2% savings. That equates approximately to the state share of two cents on the gas tax. The goal in ODOT is to get those dollars back on the road. Here are some of the ways that we're trying to improve productivity and improve the way uh, we manage your dollars. We are consolidating project selection and delivery. We are streamlining the delivery of our projects from the design stage on through to construction. Second, in the area of maintenance. We are setting standards and reporting systematically our performance. I firmly believe that what gets measured gets done. And at ODOT, we are reporting, comparing, measuring, and showing some competition between our districts to have a better product. 
Third, we are prioritizing pavement preservation over modernization. We are taking care of the basic system first. This is designed to combat Oregon's sagging road condition ratings, which I'll discuss in a minute. Fourth, we're pursuing partnerships with each county to improve operations. I've extended a letter to the counties asking them to help us in achieving anything from cooperation to consolidation of our workforces. We are co-locating facilities, we are combining work crews, and we are combining ownership of our roads in one county in particular, and that's Jackson County. We've combined the crews, we've consolidated the roads in an effort to make savings to the taxpayer. If these are the Jackson County roads and these are the state roads, we've combined that road system and we're sending our crews out over the roads in a very efficient, effective manner. In that one county alone, we estimate that each of us in a very conservative estimate just starting out, there's many more savings down the road, are saving $250,000 a year in, a, in, a, in that single county. At DMV, uh, we have several improvements <coughs> underway, but we are looking uh, seriously at the privatization effort. We are trying to pri uh, privatize whatever makes sense. Uh, we are going fairly slowly on that in order to make sure that we cautiously and carefully get it right the first time but we are working with the legislature. We're reducing the processing time for titles, registrations, and licenses, and we are trying to reduce customer wait times. Already, we've been there one year. Jan Curry is the head of the DMV, and she's doing a great job of it. Already, our wait times are down 25% from what they were, and that is down, uh, let me give you an example. When we came on the summer before we came on, they were at 45 minutes. The commission was very concerned, the legislature was very concerned, the governor was very concerned. We brought that down the first summer, down to 20 minutes, and we're down to 16 minute wait times. Now, no one wants to promise their customers that you're going to have to wait 16 minutes to get the job done. But given the staffing levels we have, uh, our statewide averages, uh, we have made a 25 percent improvement and we expect to do better. In the area of the motor carrier improvement, in the area of motor carriers, our improvements have focused on consolidating staff. We've eliminated 14 positions um, on a base of 300. Uh, that may not sound like much to you, but it's headed in the right direction. We've uh, automated our truck pass-through. Many of you may have seen on the pavement driving from Portland to Salem. There are scales actually in the pavement in two lanes in Salem. We've invested in electronic license plates working with the trucking industry, so they have a transponder on the truck. And given the signals that can be back, passed back and forth, the trucking industry can keep moving down the highway assuming that their paper is in order and the truck has been inspected safely. That's money back in the pocket of the trucking industry. We are working very hard to reduce evasion, uh, which the truckers have pointed out is uh, fairly significant. That, if we are successful in working with the truckers over this next year, will also reduce their ta the taxes they pay by reducing the tax rate. We will simplify the administration come hell or high water. Um, it's a tough tax to implement, but in, again, in partnership with the truckers, we'll bring their costs down as well as ours. And lastly, we're establishing uh, an efficiency committee to begin to meet in January that will bring together the public and the private sector to monitor some of the things I've just uh, covered and to see if there aren't more ways we can work to get more efficient. In another way, our efficiency gains can be, there are other ways our efficiency gains can be made in managing the current system that we have much better. One of the ways we're doing this is using technology to better manage the existing system. This will help the public make better decisions. It'll allow them to make their own decisions given an improved information system. We have what we call the Intelligent Transportation Systems, ITS in our jargon, which will enable us to address the issues of congestion, safety, and efficiency. We now have many cameras mounted on urban freeways and even some on some of the mountain passes. Uh, we have, uh, in conjunction with the internet, uh, you can do it now, but we hope to get more cameras soon. You, you call up, uh, dial up ODOT, tap into your computer for traffic, and you can get a picture of the Santa Ana Pass today at updated at five minute intervals. Now, that may not sound like much, but we're going to two and a half minute intervals, and soon we'll be able to have online the cameras up in the Portland metro region, so you can do in Portland what you can do in Seattle, and that's dial up and see which way it is uh, that's clearest to take home. That makes my system work more efficiently by using cameras and letting you make the decisions. Secondly, we are working with local and our local and state partners in helping develop transportation system with the community in mind and helping develop those communities to develop in a more, uh, in a, uh, develop more wisely, 
you will, um, by ensuring that land use and transportation decisions work to enhance livability and better manage the increased traffic demands before they work. You've heard reference to growth management um, and to transportation growth management. These are our activities, particularly with the uh, uh, Department of Land Use and Conservation. Third, we are uh, putting our commissioners to the test um, by attempting to uh, develop an access management program that wrestles with state highways and wrestles with the issue of the through street needs with the main street needs of communities. This gets us into almost every community in the state. Another way the department is moving to increase the return on taxpayer dollars is by working with our customers, by maximizing the effectiveness of our partnerships with both the private sectors and the public sectors. We have instituted community-based partners. We have uh, directed ODOT staff to work with locals. We still need to continue to worry about the through traffic needs, but what we are uh, working very hard to do is let the local vision help dictate what happens on the state transportation system so that ODOT isn't coming in and deciding where the highway goes, how it goes, and when it gets imposed, but instead letting the local vision uh, resonate with our uh, transportation designers and builders. The goal here is to have state government support the community vision and goals, not let transportation rule. Secondly, we're working very closely with our state agencies. The governor has established a community solutions team involving DEQ, housing, economic development, transportation, and land use and conservation. We meet regularly to attempt to get one answer back to a local jurisdiction, not five, to help to blend our regulations and also to improve our program coordination so in advance local governments know how it is the state expects to work with them. Third. We are trying to involve our private sector stakeholders in our decision-making process. I have private sector members now engaged on our hiring panels and sitting on many advisory committees, and there are many more to come. We are experimenting with design-build, which if you're in the private enterprise is not an uh, unfamiliar term. When you're going to build a building, you allow your architect and your construction firm to talk together, and in many cases they put in a proposal as one. In the transportation uh, process, in the road building process particularly, we have in the past had a design phase and the design phase ends and then the construction phase begins and there's very little conversation between the two, if any. We're t trying to take that wall down and allow contracts to come together. It's less scary for us, frankly, than it is for the Associated General Contractors, but they've been great partner. There was a bill that required this in the legislature, the bill didn't pass, and we've taken up the reins and are, are trying to move it down the field. The Local Government Advisory Committee was something that had been defunct, and we've reinstituted that. It allows us to regularly have contact from local governments, letting us know what they care about. This is their forum on a monthly basis to bring to us issues so that we have a, uh, an ongoing customer service line, if you will, for some of our most important partners. Fourth is our partnership with the legislature. We are in the process of rewriting our budget midstream, not for the next session, but for now, putting our budget in English. And frankly, it really wasn't in English. It was in limitation ease, and it was in bureaucraties, and you couldn't open it up and find out what our rail program was or was doing. So we're turning it into a more outcome-oriented, product-oriented budget. Second, we're working with the interim committees uh, in the development. Instead of being called forward uh, for testimony, uh, we're working with them in advance to see if we can't move their agendas uh, and develop the packages they're interested in. They still have to work with their colleagues to get them passed. I can't do anything about that. But the department is trying to be very much more responsive. We're also increasing our communications regularly with the legislature. And last on this issue, I'd like to note the Secretary of State's office. Uh, as you know, there was a small bill down in Salem that didn't pass. It contained some gas tax uh, increases. And included in that bill was a performance audit of our department. The bill failed. And the next day after the legislative session, I called up the Secretary of State's office and said, come in, come in and do a performance audit, and please bring the private sector with you. Uh, their first draft doesn't involve the private sector enough, as far as I can tell, and we're most likely going to be going out for an additional management review um, with the private sector uh, conducting the review, because we really need the input, a fresh look. The commission supports that, the governor supports that, and I need it as a new director. Our return on the dollars we invest in transportation, however, is decreasing. It's decreasing because though we are trying, we are not able to maintain prior investments in Oregon in the existing transportation infrastructure. I hate to report that, but the pavement conditions in our state have dropped. They've dropped 5% over a three-year period. 
Uh, we've been able to maintain them the last two years, but all projections are that they're heading down. We have about 200 miles of road that will slip into poor condition over the next biennium. The reason that's important is because when a road slips into poor condition, <clears throat> rather than catching it before it reaches that condition, it costs four to five times as much to bring it back into good condition. That's no way to run a business and it's no way to run a government. The buying power of the dollar we invest in transportation has eroded. We have not had an increase since the 91 session and the buying power by 1999 will have dropped 16%. All of this while the cost to the taxpayer in real terms has actually decreased over the last decade. Oregonians now pay the equivalent of a third of a cent a mile in state gas tax for their road system, which was uh, a decade ago was only a half cent, or was a half cent. So we've gone down a, from a half cent a year ago to a, a, to a decade, are you following this? We've gone down <laughs> from 10 years ago from a half cent to a third of a cent a mile. So people are making less of an investment in a system that needs more of an investment. Our current capital program today is half what it was four years ago. The commission just adopted a, a, a capital improvement program. We're not investing more, we're investing less in the capital side. And if the governor's proposal to the Oregon Transportation Commission is successful, we will be investing zero in capital in the next four years. You wanna know, Ray, I'll ask this question. You wanna know, do you think this governor's idea is a good one? And I think he's absolutely smart to put on the table why would we invest more money in a system that's falling apart? Why would we invest in a new system while the existing system is falling apart? We need to maintain what we have before we expand. If we ignore these fiscal realities and do not choose a sound and responsible transportation investment strategy, our return on our investment will continue to diminish. Furthermore, there are a number of trends that compound this problem. For example, over the last 10 years, traffic volumes have grown twice as much as the population. Traffic volumes have gone up 40% in the last 10 years and our population's only gone up 20%. Over the last decade, urban congestion has tripled. Over the last 10 years, it's gone from 20% of our roads being congested to 60% of our roads being congested. As congestion continues to worsen in the coming years, our quality of life will be degraded. As a community, we are already beginning to feel the effects of road rage as we spend more time stuck in traffic. We have road rage in Portland, Oregon. For all of these reasons I've just mentioned, our ability to meet the transportation needs of Oregon's future is diminishing, and it's diminishing quickly. Is this the vision? Is this the vision you have for your community and for your life here in Oregon? I think this community, the Portland business community, the state business community, must weigh in on this issue. I think as the Director of Transportation that the business community in Portland and statewide was visibly absent from the last legislative discussion. The demands on our system are running ahead of the investments that we are making. All Oregonians have a stake in the future of our transportation system. The investment decisions that we make today will determine if Oregon's economic prosperity and quality of life will continue or whether they will decline right before our eyes. In 1997, the decision was made by the Oregon legislature that we would live with the existing investment levels we have. We at ODOT heard the message. We are striving to stretch every single dollar by being more efficient, by being a top-notch agency, by strengthening our partnerships with others, we will get there. And we at the department will continue to work closely with the legislature on an ongoing basis to maximize results. But I must report to you that regardless of the savings we find or how remarkable we will become as an agency, nothing, nothing can replace a sound investment strategy for this state. Thank you very much. Following Grace is a little bit like a lawnmower following a combine. Um, <laughs> but since I know a lot about combines, I have to drive one once in a while. I try to stay out of the way. Um, we all know the story of the emperor's new clothes. 
it took a child to point out to the kingdom that the king didn't have any clothes. The child's observation could logically have led to a policy question for the kingdom. Is a good public policy for the king to pretend and ask his people to, to pretend that something's there when the something doesn't even exist? I think that's called a myth. At least in Eastern Oregon, we call that a myth. And myths are what I want to talk to you about today, myths and transportation quality. So I know you've all had lunch, but I'm going to be giving you a lot of policy questions because the whole transportation issue is very complicated, um, as you heard from Grace. And she was talking pretty much about the state system. Oregon's transportation system began with Lewis and Clark. The system we know now of roads, streets, highways, bridges, airports, rail, maritime ports, transit, and light rail has developed need by need over two centuries. Every time you leave your home, you use the transportation system in some way. You did today and you will when you leave this room. We take it for granted. Originally, roads and streets were built by men giving a day's work with his tools, his horse, his mule, or his ox. Today, we pay in other ways. We pay gas tax, uh, trucks pay weight mile tax, planes pay aviation fuel and jet fuel tax, and revenues from timber cut pay for almost half of the county system. Public policy has shaped our transportation system. What happens to that system when policy begins to be set by myth? For instance, we all act as though we have one multimodal interconnected transportation system across the state, but actually we don't. There are small maritime ports and airports, one or two good local transit systems, and practically no rail. There's a skeleton out there. What we do have across Oregon is a highway, road, and street system. The effect of having state policy built on myth is that there's no follow through to address either the needs of a multifaceted system or fund it. Another effect is that a truly multimodal system has grown in the region that has the most economic activity, no matter what state policy is. The Portrait metro area has the closest thing to a multimodal system that there is in Oregon. It has a north, south, east, west, rail, um, railroad line, very active ports, a transit and light rail system, and a growing freeway street and road system. There are even taxi cabs. <laughs> the rest of Oregon has small ports, airports, very limited rail, and even more limited transit, but nothing that compares with the interconnected system in the metropolitan region. What the rest of the state has is a good street and road system. That street and road system carries the life of the rest of the state, but it limits the potential of that life because it's the only type of system that there is. The economic growth of the metropolitan region will create more transportation demand. Hence, more modes of transportation will develop. State policy continues to increase development and con congestion within the metro region, but ignores the rest of the state. The myth of the statewide multimodal transportation sy system ignores cause and effect. It also means that the need to drive development out of an already congested and increasingly overburdened region is not being addressed. It doesn't look like it's going to be. Transportation issues are not disconnected from growth issues of either the economy or population. Even myths are connected. The legislative policy of not funding our transportation system in 93, 94, 95, 96, 97 focused on the myth that you could limit growth and congestion, you could limit it, if streets and roads were not upgraded or maintained. This myth says that as our congestion gets worse, people will either get fed up and move out of Oregon or they won't move here at all. The only place in the state where growth management may be driven by traffic congestion is in the metropolitan region, the same region that has the only multimodal transportation system. 
it may be valid to have transportation planning pay a role, play a role in directing growth, but the key is planning. Public debate, driving public policy for the good of the whole. The last three legislative sessions, there's been a de facto acceptance that Oregon's transportation system is really a road system by focusing on the gas tax. And by focusing on the gas tax, all other transportation issues have been avoided. In 1993, the Oregon legislature declined to raise gas tax. The legislator said, we're tired of all these little bills coming in here for all these transportation bills from all directions, for port, transit, bridges, streets, roads, maintenance, new construction. They wanted one omnibus, multimodal transportation package. <coughs> transportation interest from across the state worked for over a year. In 1995, we took a multimodal transportation bill to the legislature. It brought rail, maritime, airports, transit, roads together in a true statewide multimodal plan and funding package. The legislature de de uh, declined to pass it. They said it was too big. The legislature ignored the specifics of the bill and focused on a gas tax, which didn't pass either. What is the effect of public policy that asks citizens to undertake a process to develop one interconnected transportation bill and then avoids every policy issue and need raised by the bill. In 1996, groups of people across the state worked again for months to bring a thoroughly thought out transportation bill to the legislature in 1997. The work was ignored and the fight focused on a gas tax. And once again, it failed. What is the effect of public transportation policy that places the blame for the rejection of the transportation bill on one piece of the package? Repeatedly, the gas tax. Let's talk about that really big myth, the gas tax. The biggest myth of all is that the gas tax funds all kinds of transportation. The gas tax funds streets and roads. It does not fund rail, transit ports, or airports. It does not even fund the entire highway, road, and street system. In reality, gas taxes fi finance around 45% of the annual expenditures of the city and the county system. Most of the remaining funding for the largest segment of the system, the county system, comes from timber revenues. And there, there's another problem, and there is another policy question. On the east, on the, um, on the east side, the revenues are stable. The timber revenues are supported by federal government payments to the west side counties under the spotted owl guarantee. Now, this guarantee only has five years left. The east side counties have no federal timber revenue guarantee, and the bottom has fallen out. Wallawa County had $3 million in timber revenues for road repair and maintenance in 1994, $3 million. Last year, they had 800000 all across Eastern Oregon, counties have lost between 60 and 80% of their timber revenues in the last six years. This is compounded by the fact that of the 27,000 miles in the county road system statewide, in Eastern Oregon, only 9,600 are paved. We're not even talking about asphalt and concrete. We're talking about rock and dirt. Counties like Union, Gillum, and Malheur are taking up asphalt and letting it go back to gravel. The public may believe that gas tax funds, that gas tax funds all streets and roads. The Oregon legislature knows better, or they should know better. If it were not for timber revenues paid to the counties, the Oregon system would be in crisis right now. Not raising the gas tax for six years doesn't seem too <coughs> critical, unless it's viewed 
against all the other connected policies and issues of this entire statewide system. One of the best examples of setting policy by myth is the ODOT's a mess, so we're not going to fund anything policy. The legislature has declined to fund the system because they say the Oregon Department of Transportation needs to operate better. What is the effect of policy, public policy, of not funding any of the system because somebody believes part of it's in trouble or not doing something right? ODOT has responsibility for about 8,000 miles of the entire about 40,000 mile system. It's the most expensive part of the system by far. It carries most of the heaviest loads, most of the congestion. It's got to be constructed to do both those things. They can't do with rock and gravel roads. Maintaining that this part of the system occurs under the worst conditions of pressure by the public. Have they done everything they could do? Probably not. But is the ODOT problem so great? Is it so measurable that it should impact and set state policy for the entire system? I want you to think about that. I want you to think about that in the winter when they're all digging us out. I want you to think about that this winter. How bad is it? Or are we dealing with another myth? To refuse an entire multimode transportation plan for Oregon developed by the people from across the state on the grounds that one segment may have a problem, once more sets policy that avoids the tough transportation issues. Another good example of public policy avoiding <coughs> issues is the loss of rail across the state. Congress allowed rail lines to be abandoned all across this nation. The effect of this public policy decision was to shift the heaviest loads to the street and road system, a burden it was not designed to carry. Our streets and roads are carrying more trucks as well because another congressional act, trucking deregulation, has put more trucks on the road, increased trucking competition, thus forcing all competing trucks to look for any means possible to save another two cents of mile cost. The trucking industry had their own transportation myths, that they are overpaying for the damage they cause. Neighboring states give them a better deal than Oregon. Autos cost all the ruts with their studded tires. Weight mile tax is punitive. They oppose any transportation package that does not eliminate the weight mile tax. The weight mile tax is part of constant responsibility, a formula that has worked over time that places responsibilities where it should be on cars and trucks. What is the effect of public policy that would allow the trucking industry out of the weight mile tax? Truckers say it wouldn't mean anything but they refused to agree to a trial period to see what it would be. There are policy issues to spare in the debate over funding our kingdom's transportation system. There are myths enough to keep the little boy running around yelling about clothes until he's old enough to drive. <laughs> if we as citizens of Oregon refuse to pay more and make the investment in our transportation system when the economy is good, if we let it deteriorate when we could pay for it, what's it going to look like when the economy turns? And then what are we going to do? And at what cost? How long can we afford to say we don't want to pay for it? By the next legislative session, it will have been more than eight years since we had an increase in the gas tax. By then, the West Side Owl Guarantee will have only three years left to run. Are we going to be talking about how to replace those revenues in these counties? By then, the East Side counties will have lost millions more in timber revenues. A real transportation debate in the community of Oregon has got to start now. It must not wait for the next session when short-term limited legislators once again look for a quick fix. The people of Oregon must begin the public debate over their system, the whole system for the whole state. Public policy must be driven, driven by good public debate, not sound bites and headlines. This may well be the only forum to get it started, and I'm glad that the City Club exists and provides that forum. 
I want you to notice that I didn't even mention the policy towards bridges since we always ignore them and we pretend they can't fall down, at least until I get across it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Laura and Grace. Uh, it's uh, interesting to hear the whole state perspective uh, and part of the ODOT and then to look at it in terms of how it's working outside of the Portland metropolitan area where most of us uh, fight through the traffic on a daily basis. Um, well, to ask sort of a, a question that uh, has to do with dreaming, perhaps, um, you've talked about the fact that we have this increasing congestion and I'm wondering uh, if in, there is a policy sitting and waiting at ODOT for dealing with congestion, should there be some money to support getting us out of this situation? Um, the question is if we don't have a pot of money sitting there and money isn't the only thing that's going to help us. Um, I think uh, there's a, all aspects to your question. One of the things is uh, in transportation, particularly in a metropolitan area like this, um, congestion's uh, best friend is transit and transit's best friend is congestion and when Laura mentioned that you have a multimodal system here uh, we do need to work in harmony um, the major corridors leading into the Portland metro region and when you think about it uh, uh, the Banfield is built in Sullivan's Gulch it's a gulch it's going to cost a lot to move that dirt one way or the other if you want to slap another lane down if you uh, try and get through the canyon there's a reason it's called a canyon okay once again you're gonna have to move a lot of dirt to try and get a new road in there I-5, north and south, built along the river in many parts. Um, the, the, the solutions in the Portland metro region are not to slap another lane of traffic down there, to slap another light rail system down, another uh, one in different directions. So I think in terms of capacity relief, capacity relief, uh, we can look to transit. It, it can take many forms. Um, also, the bus system raised getting up good. <laughs> Um, uh, the bus system is there. Uh, statewide, though, I would say that uh, the issue of congestion is hit statewide. When we go, when the commission was in Ontario, it heard about congestion. We hear about it in Pendleton, in Medford, in Eugene. We hear about congestion all over the state, Lincoln City. And it's not just in the cities anymore, it's between the cities, it's on the long links. And that's why you, you heard me talk about access management policies. What is it we're saying? Where is it through traffic? Where is the signal we're trying to send to the people go and where is it slowing down? And we have to wrestle with that. The Commission's doing a great job. It's a tough decision. It's the only state I see wrestling with that question. Uh, and I've, I've been out, uh, you know, working with states for a long time. So we have access management. We have transit as an ally. And we have growth management policies that look at the land use question first. We are truly looking at trying to send signals back and forth between local governments and the state, attempting to uh, agree upon, if you will, the land use pattern that meets their local needs, but also meets the fact that, that in most places, Main Street, in most parts of Oregon, most cities in Oregon, Main Street is a state highway. And the cheapest place for someone to develop is on the state highway. Now, that's not the cheapest place statewide for someone to develop. But when they develop on the state highway, then I have a lot of local trips clogging up that road so that through traffic has a hard time getting through. And that's why everyone experiences congestion. What we're, what we're doing at ODOT is working with the land use and the local governments to try and figure out if there's some way, if there isn't some way to put that growth on a on a uh, perpendicular county road, for example, so that through traffic is clear and your little local stops aren't made on the state highway if they don't need to be. So we have a number of issues that we need to deal with. And frankly, uh, money isn't the first place I go on that. It is that discussion of the land use and transportation connection. Laura, you want to find money? Chris Smith, club member. As a uh, Multnomah County voter, I was faced with the choice of what to do on the referendum question on local fees. Uh, and I had a hard time deciding whether to vote no and send a message to the legislature and hold them accountable or to, uh, to vote yes. And I took the more desperate course and voted for local funding. Um, the fact that all of those referenda failed, uh, what message is the legislature going to take from that? Are, are they going to be held accountable or are they going to think that citizens don't care? Well, that's a wonderful question because what I have already heard from several legislators is, see, we were right, the people didn't want it either. So, uh, you know, I guess that's one of the reasons I'm here at the City Club 
is because they think that this this issue and it went it goes to what Grace said when she opened her comments and that is vision. What is the vision for Oregon? Have we lost the vision? Have we lost the courage to have a vision? Because if the people have the will, if the people have the vision, then the legislature will hear it. But if they don't, we're going to muddle through, I guess. Chris, I think the, uh, it was a lose-lose proposition. Yeah. Where did you go, Chris? It's a lose-lose proposition. Um, if, the, if it would have passed and the, uh, the uh, gas taxes were collected locally or the vehicle registration fee in one case was collected locally, that would have been harder to sew together a statewide package because local representatives would have come down. So we would have lost if they would have passed. I personally didn't hold it against the counties for going out and trying to solve their own problems. I think they needed to report back to their locals. I don't think it's going to make a hill of beans worth of difference. I think people that opposed the tax in the first place are going to use this excuse, mm -hmm. and those that had the courage to vote for it again are not going to be dissuaded because of the outcome. I, frankly, I don't think it's going to have much of an mm -hmm. effect in Salem. It might have had it gone the other way. Ray Polanyi, a City Club member. Uh, I have to criticize the City Club. In our program, it said, Oregon is far from having a comprehensive long-term plan for its transportation infrastructure. I submit that we do have a plan. It's the Oregon Transportation Plan passed in 1992. The problem is the funding. As the judge justly said, the vision is for a multimodal interconnected system. However, the funding, as the judge rightly pointed out, primarily funds highways. Mm -hmm. In fact, only highways when, when the taxes are automobile related. The transportation plan in the finance section on various occasions talks about flexibility. And the federal gas tax <coughs> due to iced tea and hopefully best tea or next tea, whatever will happen, will maintain the flexibility provision. The state does not. I think the people realize that there is a good amount of money flowing into the state. You mentioned 1.7 billion for a biennium. The figure I got from ODOT for the three major taxes was 1.4, which means about $700 million a year. I think the people are, have trouble believing that that's insufficient to maintain and preserve what we got. It may not be enough to expand and to build but it certainly should be enough to maintain what we have. In fact, there should be sufficient money left for the alternatives. So, question. <laughs> when will ODOT think out of the box, as the governor has said, and go to the people and tell the people what we need is the flexibility to fund all transportation-related alternatives wherever needed in whatever way they are needed, in the best way form. When will ODOT do that? ODOT Ray, do that? I think uh, the commission and ODOT um, are thinking out of the box right now. That OTP came from talking to the public. The Oregon Transportation <coughs> Plan was developed um, by the commission. It thinks out of the box. Uh, the flexible funding uh, that is available today at the federal level is, is uh, we we flexed in the past, flex funds from highways to transit. Uh, we flexed in the past and, and will continue to remain open in the future. I think the Commission has agreed with you in terms of putting the priorities on the existing infrastructure that's there. Uh, we spend on capital, I don't, out of that $1.7 uh, billion dollar budget, uh, we estimate we'll spend about $100 million of that on capital. The rest goes to maintain what we have, to collect the taxes and to put the money out on the road. And I'm telling you, four square in every employee's mind is this concept of better return on the tax dollar. I don't think that the, if we put out on the ballot uh, the option of flexing the gas tax to transit, though, I don't think it passed today. The voters aren't ready for that. I don't know if they should be. Uh, we've got an integrity uh, issue with the voters just returning uh, the gas tax dollars we've got, making sure that they feel they get a good return. Uh, what the bill that failed, attempted to do, was set up a fund to take care of the elderly and disabled transportation, which is a statewide service. The, the, it, was a, it was a first step. Um, the total state doesn't benefit from fixed route transit. Now, the majority of the state does and the majority of the populace does, 
but there's not a fixed route is the you know a bus running on a regular route as opposed to a more demand responsive bus which is what some of the elder care and uh, div uh, disabled care is about and um, I think that the Commission accurately reflects where the public is now but they've got an eye on the future that that I don't think frankly is reflected in the public if the public is reflected in what the legislature is made up of. Laura? I just want to make a real quick comment about that. One of the reasons I wanted to come here today is because I wanted to make everybody have, have a chance to hear that when you talk about ODOT and you talk about their funding, you're talking about around 8,000 miles of a 40,000 mile system. And there is a tremendous amount of money that's being put in there right now from the counties that come out of timber revenues and out of the cities that come off of property tax. As those timber revenues go away, the question is going to get harder and it's going to get bigger. It's not going to get smaller. <clears throat> uh, Tom Stimmel, a member of the club. My question is for Judge Pryor. Does Gilliam County actually get timber revenue? No, I'm sorry, we don't. <laughs> we, all of our trees are on the courthouse lawn and we name, name them. We don't have any <laughs> trees. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I wish we did. Our trees are coming through on trucks from the cut in Wheeler County. We're watching them go by. Bill Savage, club member. Uh, I, it seems like without really much expertise, but just looking at the ruts in the road each spring and hearing the clacking of the, of the studs on tires, it looks like those studs are doing an awful lot of damage. And it, it, it just drives me nuts to, to see our, the people that are complaining about the roads appear to be wrecking the roads. Am I missing something? And, and if I'm not, is there anything we can do to regulate or make it more difficult for, for those studs to be on the road? We'll Thank let you. Eastern Oregon ask, answer the question <laughs> first. As I drove into town with my studs clacking, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Eastern Oregon's uh, view on this, frankly, is that maybe cars weigh around 4,000 pounds and trucks weigh 80,000. And uh, you've got other problems on those roads besides studs. And I'm not sure I'd want to live where I live uh, without studs at least part of the year. But that's an Eastern Oregon answer. I'll give you a statewide answer. Um, <laughs> studs do, we estimated two years ago, we estimated about $40 million worth of damage a year. We do nothing to collect for that particular user fee. Um, and one of the things I'm testing as I go out, and when you get to the eastern <coughs> side of the mountains, you just get shot for asking the question. But I ask it anyway, you know, uh, can we do with either banning studs or can we have the people oh. that put studs on pay for the damage they do? Uh, with, when we talked about putting a $10, $10, $11 tax per tire on the cars, that was only covering about three to four million dollars of the 40 million damage that's done. So and that's when you bought a new tire that doesn't tax everyone every year. So uh, I, I guess if you're not going to make them illegal, I think that we ought to stay with that user fee concept and make those that feel they need studs pay for it. What, what we've had in the meantime is some good work by Les Schwab and others uh, to get both, there's a soft stud that's out there that apparently the stud owners don't think does quite the job the full studs do or whatever, I don't know what the terminology is here. Um, uh, but an all-weather tire uh, that, that has the equal amount of traction. And so uh, I think there's going to be some progress on the technology side that may help us out over time. But right now, uh, we have a lot more damage that's done than is paid for by the stud owners. Uh, Don Barney, member of the club. So we got zip out of the last three sessions. And the local effort, uh, as you suggest, Grace may not amount politically to a hill of beans. But what do we do? in 1999. What, do we go back with the kind of approach in 1993 which was comprehensive? Do we just sit and talk about uh, cost efficiency and improving ODOT's record? Uh, do we go back to the gas tax, which everybody suggests is not the way to go? What, what should the dialogue be about, and the package for that matter, in 1999? I want to throw one more problem on the table you didn't, Don, just to make it really dire. Um, the gas tax, in terms of its earning power, is not the course of the future. The problem with the discussion at the last legislative session is we were discussing the past. We were not discussing the future. There's a couple things associated with the future. Ten, uh, 
If you go back 10 years, we were getting 21 miles per gallon. Now we're getting 13 miles per gallon. That's great for you, but it's not so great for me because you're driving more miles and not paying me until you've driven a few extra miles. And so in terms of the future, um, both on the truck side and on the auto side, the, the fleet's getting better. Um, the other piece of good, bad news is the electric vehicle. I mean, it's coming. Uh, some fuel, something other than diesel-fueled uh, vehicle is on its way. And if that happens, um, I don't have any tax mechanism in place to charge them so that the user fee remains as we go into the future. So I think it's even worse than you stated. And so for the answer, we'll turn to the judge. <laughs> <laughs> See what I mean about the combine? Uh, <laughs> and I was running, too. Uh, <laughs> um, I, think the, I think the answer has got to be partially in this room. And that's my charge to you as a city club, is, is to get some vision out there. Because all those questions um, that Don asked are absolutely valid. All the questions that have been on the table here, I think, are valid today. But unless there is some vehicle that gets a discussion going beyond the Oregon Transportation Commission, supports the kinds of things they're doing, and starts trying to figure out what is it we're going to do. We're not going to have, I don't think we're going to have that debate in the Oregon uh, legislature. I don't think that's going to happen. Not the debate that needs to happen to address the questions that Don raised. I don't think that's going to happen there. And the only other vehicle I can think of is either Sizemore or you folks. <laughs> I, I want to I, I add just a, just a, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't touch that line up. Um, one more observation, and I tried to make it in my opening remarks. Um, the business community was fairly silent down in Salem. Uh, our agency was not so broken that you shouldn't have invested in it. There were some things yeah. we could do. We're doing it. I'm no worse than any other state agency. I, I've, I'm new to the agency. I've got no big ownership in it. I'm no worse than a lot of companies I've worked with before. My service is actually better than some. So we're not the excuse. What's happened? I, when I came back to the state, I was really dismayed by where you were on education. And we're just heading the same route in transportation. We're going down the tubes. What I saw, the discussion I saw in Salem was, um, was obfuscating uh, by bailing out the, the schools you know, at the state level and stealing the, the rest of the state government budget. I'm all for schools, and I think you ought to take care of that before transportation. So I, I'm a big fan. But um, we're, we're obfuscating. I mean, we're uh, uh, leaving behind our responsibilities uh, and abandoning them in the areas of school. And what I saw when I came back on the transportation area is that we're going the same route with transportation schools. I think we've got to go back to the citizens and rethink what this state's all about. And frankly, as a you know, person coming back, I was very, very disappointed. Just sad. Let's have one more sharp question. <laughs> <coughs> Pete, I'll try to make it short. Dan Goldie, City Club member. That's a very difficult assignment, though. Uh, Laura, I was very pleased to hear you point out to a club that is oriented to the urban area, that the counties are in real serious jeopardy because of the diminution, diminution of timber revenues. There is an even bigger crisis looming faster with Senator Hatfield no longer chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee. Yep. It's a question of how long the Congress is going to be willing to pay out the dole to the ONC counties so-called owl payments, yeah. when the revenues are not being generated by timber sales. So the question is this. I think the eastern counties are also in jeopardy because it's a question of whether they'll actually do the salvage sales that they're talking about. My question is this. With a legislature where the leadership has essentially come from the rural areas that we've had, and that's with one exception, that's basically where the leadership is from. Why is it that this legislature has been unwilling to address a transportation issue which is so vital to the economic prosperity and future of the rural areas of the state as well as the urban area? Well, that's a wonderful question because uh, I had a wonderful opportunity as well to beard our Eastern Oregon legislators in their den on a repeated basis uh, and ask them that same question. 
And the question, the answer I got was, you've got to do some horse trading to get some votes, and you know, the, it just wasn't going to happen. They couldn't get the votes. That was the answer that they gave to me. I'll tell you what I said to them was, you don't have any courage. You just don't have any courage. Because you're either going to do it or you're not going to do it. And the legislature has become a place, and, and I'm speaking for my own legislators from east of the mountains. I believe that it's a place where things die. It should be a place where you have the genesis of the best that comes out of the state. That's where the vision should come from. And I don't think we've got the leadership happening, at least east of the mountains. I'm not going to speak for the rest of the state. But I can tell you that's how I feel about our legislators, and that's what I said to them. If Things are going to have to come from vehicles like this. And I hope they don't go down there and then die, because that's what I think I've seen happen. I, I want to. So, when you say that the leadership in the state isn't there, we had some fine representatives that stood up for yeah. this bill. Bob Montgomery out of Cascade Locks, yeah. Tom Bryan out of Tiger, John Watt out of Southern Oregon. Um, we had some leadership. Uh, Lehman from Coos Bay, uh, Lee Byers out of um, uh, uh, the Springfield area. Um, and the speaker, they made sure that the bill got out of the house. It got out of the house twice. It got out at a nine cent package and a $10 fee, and it got out at the, at the six cent level. So when we, when we were talking about the legislature, it, it, things did fine in the, in the, uh, on the House side, and the Senator Baker on the Senate side did a good job of bringing a bill to the floor. It just didn't make it out. And so I think we've got some leadership, and the speaker does come from the east part.